This conference will now be recorded. All right, it's 10 o'clock, and um, good morning, and welcome to Preservation Massachusetts' first ever webinar. Um, my name is Erin Kelly, and I am the Associate Director of Preservation Massachusetts. This morning, we are excited to present Climate Change, Resiliency, and Preservation. This was a very popular session at our 2019 Massachusetts Historic Preservation Conference back in September. And we're really excited to be able to present this important topic again while recording it for future reference. But just before we begin, uh, just a few housekeeping items. We will ask that all attendees please mute your phone lines. This is essential for keeping out background noise and making sure all of the audio records correctly. Second, we will be able to take questions at the end of the presentations. On the GoToMeeting menu box, you should see a chat feature. Simply write your question and we will keep track of them so we can pose them to our presenters during the Q&A portion of our webinar. As you just heard, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted to the Preservation Massachusetts um, website in the next several days. And of course, a huge thank you to our panelists for giving of their time and expertise yet again. I would now like to introduce Mary Thompson, our moderator. Mary is with Bank of America Merrill Lynch and also a member of the Board of Directors for Preservation Massachusetts. So turning it over to you, Mary. Thanks, Erin, and welcome everybody this morning. Um, so as Erin said, we presented this uh, panel discussion at the um, statewide preservation um, conference back in September, and so we're really thrilled to be able to recreate it here for this webinar. Let me just set the stage for why this is important. Uh, climate change is impacting Massachusetts communities in the form of increased temperatures, more intense pre precipitation events, riverine flooding, sea level rise, and other, measure and other measurable ways. These impacts are motivating citizens, elected officials, and planners to physically adapt their buildings, infrastructure, and whole neighborhoods and communities in order to make them more resilient. The cities and towns in the Commonwealth have historic resources, which are integral to their physical character, economy, and sense of psychological self-worth. So that's, you know, really aligns with the mission of, of Preservation uh, Massachusetts. Um, I just want to remind everybody to keep, please keep your phones on mute. So our first panelist today is Arnold Robinson. I'm going to do a brief introduction of each panelist right before uh, they do their presentation. So Arnold has been practicing in the field of community uh, planning, historic preservation, and rehabilitation, education, and urban design for more than 30 years. His career has included master planning, feasibility analysis, site design, public process facilitation, regulatory permitting, historic rehabilitation project design, project management, and construction administration. He is proud to have served in the community of the City of New Bedford, uh, the Provident Providence Preservation Society, Newport Collaborative Architects, and as Associate Dean of Community Engagement at Roger Williams University. He holds an MA in Preservation Studies from Boston University, and his BA in American Studies is from Bates College. Arnold is a, is a member of the American Institute of Certified Planners and is a certified provider in the Massachusetts Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Program. Arnold's current position is as Regional Director of Planning at Bus and O'Neill, focusing on climate change adaptation with historic New England communities. So welcome, Arnold. All right, thanks, Mary. Um, so my job for my section uh, of this uh, webinar is really to give you all a framework for the uh, resources, the organizations, uh, the programs that can support local actions um, in response to climate change uh, for historic areas and resources in Massachusetts. Um, and uh, what I want to make sure everyone knows is Aaron sent out that email uh, about an hour ago before the session, which has an attached PDF and also a web link. 
um, of a series of resources. Uh, it's a four-page document, and we handed that out uh, before the session that we did at the conference in September. Um, and it really is meant to be the companion piece to my section of the presentation. So um, everything that I will talk about is already written there. You don't need to feverishly uh, scribble notes as we go through this. Uh, there's a ton of information. Um, and just as importantly, this is really a living document. We've done some updates already on this um, from when it was in the conference session, and we look forward to hearing more about resources because uh, this is a very dynamic topic. And uh, the amount of resources that are available and the organizations that are tackling this issue um, are constantly contributing um, to it. So I can put I, it on computer audio, but then you uh, have to... Just a reminder for folks out there, if you can mute your phones or your computers, so it, uh, that would be great. Um, so, barking is new for one of my webinars. Um, so if everybody can mute their phones, it would be great. Um, so what I want to talk about is, uh, if you take a look at that climate change resource sheet, uh, and then if you can change the next slide, Aaron. Thanks. Um, what I'm going to touch on are a couple different things, are the uh, location and application resources that are out there that are available to uh, all of you as advocates um, and as preser practicing preservationists. Um, one thing that's important to recognize as we start off on this, this session was designed primarily for um, local preservationists who are gearing up on this issue. They are not already experts. Um, what was great was to look at this attendance sheet for everyone who's uh, here today. Um, we have a real mixed bag. We've got people who are um, local officials, local advocates, students and faculty. Uh, but we've also got some people who are leaders out there uh, in the preservation and uh, climate resiliency world. Um, so I think this is a, a really good mix of people. So I'll go over this knowing that we've got a broad audience. And at the end, I think the questions will allow us to bring it to a higher level of dialogue as well. So I'm gonna go over the types of resources that are available to preservationists as they think about local or regional resources um, that deal with climate change. We're gonna talk about where those resources are available. Um, and how they get applied when making local decisions, uh, whether it's risk assessment or it's adaptation methods, um, and also how you can use that among your local preservation organizations and constituencies to build up a local shared uh, base of knowledge. Let's go to the next slide, please. So when we think about the types of resources that are available, one of the scariest things that you can do is to Google um, you know, either just climate change itself, climate change impacts, or climate change and historic preservation. You will get a very broad uh, search result on that. And if we were to break that down into topics, you'll find um, a lot of science on climate change as a phenomenon. You'll, talk, you'll see a lot of international and national work about plans to address the causes, um, sort of a global mitigation uh, to reduce it, uh, and then forecasts of impacts. And of course, we see that oftentimes in sea level rise forecast um, and impacts to the um, different ice caps uh, that are going on. And then on resiliency, um, we see a lot of discussion about how adaptation can take place to respond to those impacts, um, what can be done for mitigation on a local level, and then how do you recover um, from climate change uh, impacts and events. Next slide. So I am not going to be tackling the big global issue of the science behind climate change uh, and not talking about um, plans to address causes of switch to renewable energies and all those different issues. Um, what I'm really going to talk about are the four topics that uh, remain uh, in that left-hand column, which is how can local folks understand the forecast of impacts that are going to come to them in their geography, whether that's a region or whether that's a town or city, um, and what's available as think, work that's already done that they can tap into. Um, but a lot of focus also on resiliency. Once we understand those impacts, um, how does adaptation take place? How do you mitigate on a local level um, and plan for? And then how does recovery take place for historic resources? And Mary Shanks will talk a lot about that as well. Um, next slide, please. So if we um, think of uh, some of the resources that we often find 
there is a lot of work out there in um, the international world going on at ICOMOS, International Council on Monuments and Sites, um, Association for Preservation Technology. We see a lot of global case study work about how other countries are addressing things and some examples there, um, whether that is uh, cultural heritage issues and, and, and different um, geographies that are out there in the world, uh, or we'll look at that left hand, um, how there are some macro changes going on um, with places putting in place tidal gates, um, doing seawalls, doing large scale um, sort of countrywide mitigation. The tricky part of th that information is all out there. We've excerpted some of that on page one and page two in our resource guide. Um, the question is, how does that get applied on a local level? And that can be very hit or miss. Um, so we've certainly led you to some international resources, but our focus is going to be on what's happening in the US and especially what's happening in Massachusetts. Um, next slide, please. So when we talk about forecasts of impacts to historic resources, it can be very, um, uh, disorienting to sort of see global forecasts of what might happen with sea level rise. What is going to be the increase in, increase in precipitation events uh, that are taking place in a region? Um, how do you bring that down to a local level? What we really have to rely on is what have um, either national researchers or statewide organizations and agencies done to do forecasting that is on a much more local level. If you are a historic commission, uh, a historic district commission in Massachusetts, if you're a regional planning organization, um, that is usually not the kind of data you can crunch on a local level um, to take information from NOAA um, and sort of make that work on a local level. The good news is there's lots of agencies doing interpretation to allow us to see impacts um, to historic resources. Um, and so what I'm going to focus on really is uh, are those, those issues over here of sea level rise, riverine flooding, um, storm impacts of wind and flooding, and heat impacts, all of which impact historic communities. Next slide. So there's a whole generation of tools that are available. Um, and uh, one of the things since the conference session, uh, there's two very good tools that are out there for Massachusetts uh, that are available. So one of the first that I would always urge folks to go to is um, resilientma.org. And that is the clearinghouse um, within the state of Massachusetts for most of the resiliency efforts um, that's going on um, within the state agencies. And there are some fantastic mapping tools that are available there to forecast uh, those different kinds of impacts. Another Massachusetts tool that's out there is Coastal Zone Management's website, which is really coastal, um, and but goes up into tidal rivers, which forecasts sea level rise and storm impacts. And those are very dynamic viewers um, that you can look at. But there has been some very interesting localized work, um, especially with GIS and data mapping. So um, in Nantucket, there's a partnership with the University of Florida, which has done um, very detailed on the ground to within the millimeter mapping of historic resources and forecasted climate change impacts um, to both use that for forecasting and visualization. Um, and larger cities in Massachusetts, which have very good GIS systems, um, are doing that kind of mapping as well using uh, their LIDAR uh, layers of radar um, mapping for elevations and topo and running that up against um, different kinds of flooding models. So uh, one of the things that you can do is to go and see you can always default to those state viewers to go find good information, uh, but also be talking to your local planning offices um, to see what they're doing for GIS. Uh, if folks could mute their um, phones or their computers, that would be great. Um, Maine has done a very interesting project recently. Uh, last year, they, through their GIS system, did very conscious overlay mapping, and this is all available with sort of a point and click uh, interface of all of their national historic landmark districts and resources and all their national register um, districts and resources overlaid with their floodplain mapping so that you can right off the bat without having to sort of dig into GIS just sort of point and click and see exactly where is a storm going to be impacting a historic downtown or a historic resource. Um, and so it becomes very simple to look at those two layers together even if you don't have a training in GIS systems. Um, and in Rhode Island, there is a, a simulation tool. Let's go to the next slide. 
um, which is a pretty good platform that a lot of states around the country are using uh, called Storm Tools. Uh, Rhode Island has named it Storm Tools. Other states have different names for it. It essentially takes GIS inputs um, and allows you, you can see that left hand button, um, and you can essentially just click and it will answer the question, what will future sea level rise do with my property? Um, and so what we can see here is this is a Watch Hill Historic District in Westerly, Rhode Island. Um, and it says, this is what two feet of sea level rise, uh, where it floods within that historic district. So it makes it very easy to see without needing to have a specialized background. This is the kind of information for preservationists who want to both forecast what the impacts are to historic resources, but also want to be able to take this out and show this to audiences for planning purposes um, and for advocacy purposes is a very applicable tool that's out there. If there's there's somebody out there who needs to mute their phone, please, uh, or mute their computer. Next slide. Um, the other level that you can do besides just sea level rise is you can look at storm impacts, um, which uh, you know storms are an inevitability. Uh, they are going to happen. It's just a question of when. Uh, from a probability standpoint, they'll happen. And this is, of course, what we plan for with our floodplains uh, is those storm events coming in. So there's a tab on most of these tool interactive tools that allow you not just to look at sea level rise impacts or riverine flooding, but to look at what a storm impact would be. And this is that same westerly historic district. And you can see how much more pronounced the impact is with a combination um, of two feet of sea level rise with a hundred year storm taking place on that site. Um, and you can predict then what are those potential damages to historic resources. Next slide. So as we think about some national resources that are out there and available to us, um, there are some very good things taking place uh, at um, the National Park Service. Um, one of the guides, the um, uh, if you look in that right-hand image that's there, the National Park Service did a cultural resources climate change strategy. And while this applies mostly to their own cultural resources um, within their parks, within their jurisdiction, it has some very good overarching philosophical guidance on how to prepare for climate change impacts. It frames them as the type of hazard that you're looking at for a historic resource, um, its potential impacts, and your potential mitigation or adaptation strategies uh, that you can apply to this. Uh, this came out right in 2016, uh, a very readable and applicable document. If you haven't taken a look at it, I urge you to, uh, to go think of it as a, a sort of thought leader kind of document. Following up on that, the Park Service just came out uh, in November with a um, non-graphic but very good guidelines on flood adaptation for rehabilitating historic buildings document. Um, there's a graphic version that will be coming out probably this coming year on that document. Um, but if you exist in a resource where you use the Secretary of Interior's standards as uh, a basis for decision making, it's a very applicable document. It looks at how does adaptation for historic resources um, take place through the lens of the Secretary of Interior standards and existing Park Service um, regulations and standards. So very applicable and it can be used almost immediately uh, by local agencies and by organizations that use the standards. Uh, the National Trust has been doing a, a good job with Green Lab and some of their other programs in thinking about climate change impacts and their website has some very good resources, especially case studies uh, about adaptation. Uh, the Newport Restoration Foundation um, started a few years ago and has been teaming with other uh, uh, communities and organizations with their Keeping History Above Water initiative, uh, KEHA, and that is, uh, you can go on their website or look that up and see a lot of the things that have come out of those conferences um, that apply to very particular parts of the country, like St. Augustine, um, like thinking about Annapolis and those other things. Um, so there's a lot of good work there that you can find that's national. Um, FEMA uh, has been doing a lot of this work because those impacts are direct to their programs, and Mary will talk about some of those. And I would just put a plug in also for the Georgetown Climate Center, 
um, you can find their website. And the reason I put them on there is because while they approach climate change impacts from a lot of different angles, um, it is an eminently searchable website. So you can put in uh, particular geographies by state, you can put in particular themes like historic, um, and you will find all sorts of different best practices that are out there uh, for resources that can be applied on a local or regional level. Next slide. So, um, beginning to narrow this down um, to the state, and especially thinking of Massachusetts municipalities um, and regions and, and what's out there that can be applied as your own community, Resilient MA um, really is a great starting point for that. Um, they're the lead agency in the state for climate change impacts. There's funding flowing through that office. There's a very good staff, um, and they now have regional officers, uh, which we'll talk about for their uh, vulnerability programs um, that are out there. So that's where the action is taking place, and that's worth visiting and talking to on a regular basis. Um, and of course, for, for state agencies, uh, the, the SHPO, the uh, MHC, um, as the sort of keeper of the lists of historic resources, as the reviewers of impacts through section 106 and state review, um, we'll be thinking about climate change and in its preservation planning um, as things go forward. Preservation Massachusetts, of course, a shameless plug for your statewide nonprofit, which is sort of convening around this issue and providing resources. Um, and Mass Coastal Zone Management is one of the most sort of user-friendly um, sites that's out there for information um, and is thinking about actively uh, historic resources impacted by coastal flooding. Um, one a strong plug I put in, as I hope most folks working on a local level are connected to your regional planning organizations, um, many of the resilience efforts that are taking place in Massachusetts are regional or at least towns coming together and thinking about things um, because those geographies are very similar of a, of a watershed, of a river corridor, um, of a particular topography and the historic resources can be similar. Um, so there's some very good work going on um, within the regional planning organizations, and there's coalitions around issues like environmental, transportation resources. Um, so there's, there's many things that can be found out there, and we will keep updating our resources on the Preservation Mass um, site around this topic uh, as those coalitions put more together that deal with historic resources. Next slide. So for me, one of the things that makes Massachusetts a leader um, nationally on the issue of climate change response um, is the MVP program, the Municipal Vulnerability Program. Um, so on a local level, I hope that most folks have been involved in their local level if your community has done its MVP planning. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, and it is really where the rubber meets the road in making decisions. So. Those, there's planning grants available for um, all local communities in Massachusetts to create your municipal vulnerability program, your MVP plan. And this is rapid and community driven. This is the kind of project that I facilitate on a regular basis. Um, typically a consultant will come in, we'll work with a core committee, um, and we'll locally identify the issues um, where that community is worried about climate change impacts on the ground. And it looks at it through three lenses. Infrastructure, so obviously we're thinking about bridges and dams, electric lines, gas lines, roadways, all of those kind of things. Societal, um, where are there populations that we're worried about? Um, storm impacts hitting or heat waves hitting? Um, do we have a particular place where there's elderly housing? Do we have particular places where there's schools? Um, how do we uh, approach societal issues uh, within the community? Um, and the last of the three lenses is environmental. Typically, that's been seen as natural resources, but I'm seeing communities who are more progressive in the thinking and a little more broad that are thinking about historic resources as part of their environment. It is what makes the character of their community. It may drive the economy. Um, and so if you are part of your local uh, municipal sort of climate change adaptation, hazard mitigation planning efforts, um, you can be a voice to make sure that historic resources are explicitly included in your MVP planning document that takes place. Next slide. So this is a map, this is from July, because this was the most up-to-date map. There is a new one that has been posted on the Resilient MVP uh, map that's updated. But if you take a look at this map, you'll see it down in the color coding. MVP designated communities means that those communities received a planning grant, that they did their um, 
municipal planning uh, around resiliency. Um, and it's called Climate Resiliency Building. It's a, a model planning that's done uh, through the Nature Conservancy model. Um, they identified the threats that climate change poses. Um, they identified potential actions, and that plan is published and completed, um, which means they are now designated. So those are the blue communities. The yellow are communities that at this point um, have received a planning grant, but have not completed that work yet. So they are convening those workshops, they're currently doing the assessments, um, and they will complete that and publish that um, resiliency uh, plan uh, and assessment that will identify those key issues. Um, hatched marks are where there is a regional partnership where towns got together or uh, a regional planning organization uh, convened a couple of communities to do that planning in collaboration with each other. Um, so take, you know, go to Resilient MA, look for your own community, um, see if that planning has taken place yet. If it has, read that plan and see if historic resources are part of that. Um, and if not, that's where you can begin advocating for historic resources to be considered. And if the plan hasn't been done, it's a great time to get in at the ground floor, talk to that local planner or the agency that's running the process, and um, make sure preservation uh, historic resources are represented in that planning process. Um, the green diamonds are a very important part of this, which are action grants. Um, so Massachusetts is one of the few states that has moved beyond saying, let's assess potential dangers, let's plan for potential actions, and Massachusetts has, if you will, put their money where their mouth is and has actually created funds to take actions. So once you complete your MVP plan, you are immediately put in the hopper where you can apply to do grant funding to take actions. And so if you say that you know one of our key issues is that we've got these culverts that are undersized and they cause upstream flooding, you can actually redo those culverts and apply for money to do that um, if you've got a, a downtown that's threatened, it's historic, <clears throat> excuse me, you can apply for a planning grant that is going to allow you to um, take a look at the ways that you can adapt that particular area to those potential impacts. And we expect Massachusetts to keep funding this program very strongly. There's discussion moving forward in the legislature uh, of something on the order of potentially $100 million per year um, for action to take place on the local level. Next slide. So when you do this, when you get certified, uh, you can obviously go to this. This is sort of what a plan looks like. This is Mattapoisett, um, and it shows on its cover sort of what the flooding maps look like and what the dangers are. Um, this is what you should go look for for your local community. Um, the summary of findings of what came out of that CRB workshop, um, which will say what the town has the priority for um, its dangers and what actions it plans to take in the future. Um, and so you want to definitely look to see are there impacts to historic resources embedded within those findings from that workshop. Um, one other note is that this, if getting MVP certified, will also potentially mean that you'll get a leg up in other state grant programs. Because Massachusetts is prioritizing resiliency uh, in its communities, um, we may start to see this play a role in DOT funding applications, uh, CZM funding applications. Um, and that would be great because it would mean that everything is going to fall in line with resiliency. Next slide. As I wind up, I want to um, talk about some local resources and best practices because certainly Resilient MA is a great place to go. <clears throat> But there are communities that are really taking the lead on key issues. So um, uh, also presenting at the conference in September, um, Sandwich has gotten together with the Cape Cod Commission, and they have done fantastic work um, looking at how local building officials interpret uh, both FEMA and state building code in the face of flood uh, risk um, and what's required of an owner in response to that. There's some very good work that's been done there. Um, Holly's going to tell you about what Nantucket has been doing, which is probably some of the most closely integ integrated resiliency meets preservation planning that I'm seeing across the Commonwealth. Um, Boston with Climate Ready Boston um, has consciously thought about the older building stock in the city and the historic neighborhoods um, and how guidelines for adaptation um, take that all into account. Annapolis is a leader um, from way back uh, in thinking about how it responds um, to climate change. There's some great data there. 
But if you're not a coastal community, um, there's only a couple of good examples that I've found, and, and one of them is Schenectady. Um, they have a, a neighborhood, the Stockade District, that's often flooded uh, near the Mohawk River, um, and that they have really gone full in on what adaptation looks like in a riverine community. Um, so there's some great examples there. And of course, there's some fantastic work that was done after Katrina uh, and other hurricanes on the Gulf Coast. Um, FEMA has done a good work in document, a lot of good work in documenting that. Uh, that's selective. There's, there's a lot more out there. Next slide. <clears throat> so as I transition to sort of these case studies, and, and Mary will talk about FEMA's role, and Holly will talk about Nantucket, um, I want to step back philosophically. One of the things that got me uh, passionate about exploring this intersection of climate change adaptation and preservation is a perception um, really along these three points. Um, uh, physical change response um, to climate change impacts will get made by individual property owners over a long period of time. I don't think we're going to see anything where suddenly an entire neighborhood uh, is lifted up or an entire neighborhood retreats uh, away from the sea. Uh, those are still individually owned properties. Um, and so uh, we're gonna see a lot of change over a long period of time. We as preservationists, I think, have often had, I would say, almost a luxury of being fairly conservative in how we allow or interpret change in the landscape. Um, and I think the pace of requests for change in the landscape is going to be increasing, both in the speed with which people are asking uh, us for advice and permission to change their historic structures, um, but also in the uh, uh, sort of the ways in which they're going to change them radically. Um, and so the question is, what role will preservationists play in this um, as we continue, as we see this taking place? Um, and one of the things that fascinates me is there are a lot of scattered silos of information for uh, best practices um, on options for response to climate change impacts. Uh, and I think one of the things we're trying to do with this session is to coalesce this information together, uh, this community together of people who are wrestling with these issues to sort of say, you're not alone out there dealing with this. There are resources to turn to. Um, and how can we continue to bring ourselves together and bring the best practices together so that can be applied on the local level for everyone? So <clears throat> having said that, we'll keep our questions till the end, and I'll turn to Mary to introduce the next speaker. Thanks, Arnold. That was great. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, and again, as Arnold mentioned, you can, um, we're going to keep the questions to the end, but as a reminder, you can type them in the, the chat box, and Erin will um, keep a, a record of those questions and we can ask them at the end. So our next panelist is Mary Shanks, and she is the Deputy Regional Environmental Officer for FEMA. Uh, she assists the Regional Environmental Officer in reviewing FEMA grant projects and manages Section 108 Historic Preservation Consultations for FEMA Region 1. Ms. Shanks began her FEMA career in the fall of 2012 at the Louisiana Recovery Office, assisting with ongoing recovery efforts following Hurricanes Katrina and Rita. Prior to joining FEMA, Ms. Shanks worked with the U.S. Army, initially at the U.S. Army Garrison Fort Wainwright, Alaska, and then at U.S. Army Garrison Fort Bragg, North Carolina. She's a graduate, she has an undergraduate degree in anthropology from the New College of Florida, and went on to complete her graduate studies at the University of Sheffield, United Kingdom, and was award, awarded a master's degree in historic archeology span with distinction. Mary, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you so much. All right, great. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name, as uh, Mary just said, is Mary Shanks. I'm the Deputy Regional Environmental Officer for FEMA Region 1 here in Boston. We oversee the six New England states uh, so Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk a bit today about FEMA's role uh, with um, climate change and resiliency, as well as our intersection with historic preservation and Section 106. Uh, next slide, please. Great. So like I said, today we're going to talk about FEMA's environmental and planning and historic preservation cadre. Um, I'm sure some of you are surprised to hear that we do have uh, archeologists and historic preservation specialists um, in our uh, workforce. 
I'm going to go over how we intersect with historic preservation through Section 106. Um, I'm going to review the types of FEMA grants that are available. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about uh, hazard mitigation plans um, that Holly is also going to talk about in her presentation. And then I'm going to go over some successful FEMA grants we've seen here in New England over the last few years. Uh, next slide, please. So what is FEMA EHP? Um, FEMA Environmental Planning and Historic Preservation Cadre is one national cadre made up of approximately 500 members at the moment. We are divided into 10 regional offices. Like I said, we're Region 1 here in New England. Um, we have multiple programs. Um, everything from, like I said, I'm an archaeologist. We have architectural historians, geologists, hydrologists, and every uh, biologist and every other is you can imagine under environmental. Um, we have one mission, and our mission is to help um, our communities who receive FEMA grants recover prepare for future storms, and ensure compliance with environmental and historic preservation laws. I also just want to mention one other program we have that I don't think I mentioned last time we had this presentation. It's called HENTAF, H-E-N-T-F. It is a uh, co-program managed not only by FEMA, but also by the Smithsonian. And we interact directly with cultural institutions to help them prepare for storms. Um, if anyone needs any additional information about that, I can provide it during the question session at the end. So what does FEMA EHP do? We educate and advise uh, internal and external stakeholders. What do I mean by that? That means we provide education about environmental laws and how they apply. We do presentations like this one that go over the types of grants we offer. Um, but really our bread and butter is re uh, reviewing FEMA grants for compliance. Every grant that comes into FEMA is reviewed for compliance with environmental and historic preservation laws. To give you an idea, within the state of Massachusetts last year, there were over 650 individual grant pro projects that were reviewed for compliance with environmental and historic preservation laws. We review for Endangered Species Act. We clean, clean air, clean water, uh, environmental justice and effects to floodplains and wetlands, as well as uh, Coastal Burial Resources Protection Act uh, and coastal zone management. But my real task um, as the Deputy Regional Environmental Officer is to oversee our Section 106 program. Next slide, please. So what is Section 106? Section 106 is a, a major focus for federal agencies. Um, under Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act, uh, federal agencies are required to take into consideration the effects of their activities on historic properties and to allow the advisory council through the SHPOs and the tribal historic preservation officers to comment on the potential effects of those projects on historic resources. It is, um, it can be a complicated process, but how we basically generally explain it is that it's placed that it's uh, cut down into four different steps, right? The four step section 106 process. In the first step, we define our undertaking. What exactly are we doing in this case? Are we rebuilding a seawall? Are we upsizing a culvert? Um, are we elevating a historic building? We coordinate with people who may have an interest in that project, um, SHPOs, TIPOs, um, local historic uh, communities and uh, preservation members, as well as any member of the public who might have an interest in that project. Um, once we've identified who may have an interest, we also identify any historic resources within the area, potential effect, or the area where we think our project has the potential to uh, affect historic resources. Um, and we do everything from archaeological surveys to architectural uh, evaluations. We do um, determinations of uh, eligibility for those resources. In rare cases, we work with the Park Service. Um, as part of that process, we determine whether there are national historic landmarks within our area, and if we do, we do bring in the National Park Service. Um, we consult with the SHPO and the, and the tribes and uh, other um, Indian groups, as well as uh, private nonprofits who might have an interest in our project, and we invest and inform the public about what we are doing. Um, 
after we identify those resources, we assess the potential effects. That's step three. Basically, this is just walking through and looking at what our project is doing and how it's going to be affecting the resource. Sometimes it's really straightforward. If we're elevating a building, that's going to be changing its um, overall design, feeling, and setting. Uh, if we are replacing a culvert or relocating a road, then that's going to, that could have potential infect, effects on archaeological resources. If we determine that we are going to have an effect and it is an adverse effect on that resource, that means changing one of the character defining features that makes it eligible for the National Register, we will then resolve those effects through some sort of agreement document with um, all the parties involved. And then hopefully we get to move forward with our project and help communities become more resilient as they move forward. Next slide, please. So the wide world of FEMA grants, what kind of, uh, what kind of grants are available with FEMA and how, um, how can you get involved in those? So our bread and butter with FEMA and as what most people know us for are disaster specific grants. After a disaster has impacted a community, whether it's a hurricane or a coastal storm or one of our nor'easters, um, or even just a significant rain event, um, if it is, uh, it goes through a process to be declared a, um, a major disaster. Um, and then we make public assistance funds available to states, local governments, tribal governments, and private not-for-profit organizations in order to repair and bring their properties back to pre-disaster condition. As part of that, they are also uh, eligible for potential mitigation funds to do things to protect them from future storms. Um, that includes things like elevating the houses, enlarging the culverts, uh, repairing and reinforcing seawalls and levees. Um, as part of a major disaster grant, we occasionally have individual assistance grants. Not that commonly up here in New England, happily. Individual assistance grants come into play when there's been a major impact to the housing stock in a community. Uh, individual assistance can include things like temporary housing. Uh, if we find you an apartment or uh, a trailer temporarily, um, it can also provide help with child care. And um, uh, other things that might impact community after the, after the storm. But like I said, we don't see that as commonly up here in New England happily. Um, the third grant that is a disaster specific grant is a hazard mitigation grant. Hazard mitigation grants are directly tied to presidentially declared disasters in a state. When a state is declared for public assistance funds, a certain portion of that money is set aside for hazard mitigation assistance. Hazard mitigation assistance is does not have to be directly tied to a property that was damaged during the storm. It can be any property statewide or any resource. Um, and it is competitive on a state uh, on a statewide basis. That's actually a really good opportunity for communities to harden their uh, harden their facilities and ensure that when the next storm comes, they're not in one of the uh, affected communities. We also have this whole category of things we call non-disaster grants. Um, non-disaster grants are everything from our grant program directorate. Those are port security and firefighter assistance grants. That means all those little surveillance cameras that are being put up everywhere, those, come, those frequently come through FEMA for grants. Um, we also help firefighters by putting in uh, equipment to assist them, uh, bollards and everything else around town. If everyone can mute their phones, that'd be great. Uh, so uh, another type of non-disaster grant we have is flood mitigation assistance. And that's one of the ones that I think is really key for this current discussion. Flood mitigation assistance or is for properties that have been repetitively flooded. That means they've been flooded three or more times over multiple disaster events. Um, flood mitigation assistance can include elevating a, a property um, or, and or relocating it out of the floodplain um, as part of an acquisition project. Um, but the one, the one grant I really want to go into in a little bit more detail is the Pre-Disaster Mitigation Assistance Fund. Uh, next slide, please. So Pre-Disaster Mitigation Grants are nationally competitive grants that are available every year um, at FEMA headquarters level, though your state um, emergency management agencies can help you apply for those. Um, 
the idea for pre-disaster mitigation grant funds is to help communities before storms happen. So it's kind of like hazard mitigation, but it's just available every year and is nationally competitive. Um, one of the key drivers for pre-disaster mitigation grants, uh, PDM grants, is to help communities develop hazard mitigation plans that we're going to talk about briefly, um, as well as for brick and mortar projects that aren't directly tied to a disaster. Um, one of the big changes that's coming to FEMA as the result of us trying to increase our national resiliency posture is um, changes coming out of the Disaster Recovery and Reform Act of 2018. Um, that uh, came out of the Harvey and Maria storms um, and really helped us kind of change our posture. Um, Congress has designated an additional amount of money to be set aside for PDM projects, and they're kind of changing the name. It's going to be build, Building Resilient Infrastructures and Communities, BRIC. Don't we love our acronyms? Um, so. As part of this project, 6% of the national uh, disaster relief budget for every year is going to be set aside for pre-disaster uh, mitigation grants. That is a lot of money that is going to be coming into um, the community to be available. Um, as of June, we had uh, spent $11 billion so far this year. So 6% of $11 billion can have a lot of impact in helping our communities become resilient. Next slide, please. So hazard mitigation plans. Hazard mitigation plans are really a foundational tool for helping your community or your private not-for-profit group become, uh, become resilient. What you do is, you, it, as part of developing the plan, you increase education and awareness of the threats and the hazards and the vulnerabilities of your community. You can build partnerships with people who are in, uh, who are at risk, local businesses, um, private not for profits, the public, and identify long term strategies for how you're going to reduce that. The big thing I want to highlight for, as part of hazard mitigation plans and historic preservation is that you can identify what kind of vulnerable properties you have. Historic properties can absolutely be part of that, as we know. Um, and as Arnold mentioned, they can be the backbone of the economic um, security of our town. So much of New England uh, does rely on tourism. And identifying those as critical resources within your community is a great way to help get FEMA grants. If when applying for a FEMA grant, you reference that the, that was one of the uh, goals identified as part of your hazard mitigation plan, it can help you secure the grant for that resource. Next slide, please. So, what kind of grant projects is FEMA see? Well, I've been mentioning a few of them, but we basically see a little bit of everything. We see culverts, so many culverts. Most of New, uh, New England's culverts are substantially undersized. We see projects pretty much every day where we've got culverts going from about 24 inches to about 14 feet, which is a significant change, um, but is critical to protecting the, uh, the infrastructure of our towns and ensuring that bridges and roads don't wash out during storms, leaving people trapped. Um, we see flood walls, levees, and seawalls. At the moment, I think we have uh, basically the entire Massachusetts coast that uh, we are reviewing for repairs and upgrades to seawalls. Um, we do elevations, both of roads and buildings. Um, that's really important uh, as we're seeing this, uh, the sea level rise and the increase of riverine flooding. Uh, elevations are some of the best ways we can uh, keep our communities intact while still protecting them for the future. We do flood control and stream bank restorations. Um, the idea behind these are to provide additional storage for those riverine flood pro uh, flooding events by building up more natural areas for the water to go rather than it going into our homes and communities. And we also um, do grants for the flood proofing of buildings for those buildings, municipal buildings, um, businesses and, and other resources that can't be elevated, uh, we can provide for flood, flood proofing. We do a lot of f uh, flood proofing for pump stations that are required uh, to keep our water and sewers uh, working during storms as well. Okay, next slide. So now I'm going to go over just a couple of the uh, 
a pr couple of projects we've seen here uh, in Massachusetts and in uh, Greater New England over the last couple of years that we think are uh, good examples of resiliency projects. This first one is Salem uh, in Salem, Massachusetts. It's Rosie's Pond. It was a pre-disaster mitigation uh, project, um, and it was directly tied to their hazard mitigation plan. They uh, used that hazard mitigation plan to leverage funds for the project. This particular project involved a culvert that was undersized, as well as a series of uh, channels and uh, a stream that had been channelized and was causing flooding in a low-lying historic district in Salem. Um, as part of the project, they added additional berms um, in those areas where there were space for that, as well as building up additional height to the channel walls where it couldn't be daylighted. Um, this project is still ongoing. Um, there was a little bit of discussion within the community regarding some of the aesthetics of the project. So we're still working with the SHPO's office and with Salem to finalize this project. Uh, next slide, please. Stockbridge, Massachusetts. This was also a really good project. Um, in Stockbridge, there was uh, an issue with riverine or high rain events happening in downtown uh, Stockbridge. There was flooding waters coming from the main streets and from the shopping areas down behind the historic school that is now their police station and their town hall. Um, the, the basement level or the first ground level of this property was flooding four or five times a year which was undermining the foundation and causing significant amounts of damage, not to mention uh, impacting their police station, which was located on that story. Um, it's hard to protect your community when your offices are flooding um, that frequently. So the purposes of this project was to help them by developing increased flood storage um, and redirecting the water away from the town hall back to the, Hus uh, the Housatonic River behind the property. Um, we consulted on this project not only because of the historic school, but because it's a highly archeologically sensitive area. The Stockbridge Muncie community, uh, which actually takes part of their name from Stockbridge, is a federally recognized tribe that has significant concerns in the area. So we conducted an archeological survey of the uh, sports field that you can see there, um, as well as did archeological monitoring for the construction in the parking lot behind the building. As part of that survey, we actually identified a new historic resource, um, the foundations and uh, a refuse pit associated with a house from the late 1800s was identified during the survey. Uh, next slide. Okay, so this is not Massachusetts. This is Fort Kent, Maine. But this is a really good project because it actually was a project that the town considered its effects to historic properties and chose a path that uh, protected additional resources. The Fort Kent Blockhouse is a National Historic Landmark. It was built during, uh, for the Arstook War in the 1830s um, and is really the, the, the foundation of this town. Uh, it is their symbol and their seal, and they are very proud of it. Um, during ice jams and, and high melt events in the spring and summer, um, the property has been repeated, repeated, <laughs> repeatedly flooding. Um, if you look at photos from the 1960s and the 1970s, there's water covering all of that grassy area you see in the photos, um, as well as all the area behind the, the property. In order to protect it, they wanted to extend um, a levee around the back of the property and up along the side. This is the location where two rivers meet. Um, and so they were getting a lot of flooding coming from both rivers. This has been a really successful project. Um, as part of it, we developed a, a memorandum of agreement to do HABS recordation, Historic American Building Survey, recordation of the property. Um, uh, drawings were developed for the resource as well as several public education tools and new interpretive panels that were built for the property. And best of all, now that the levee has been has been built, uh, and you can see it there, that, that stone wall behind the property, it is now well protected from storm events in the future, so it's going to be there for the community for decades to come. Okay, I think that is it for me. Thank you, everybody, and uh, I look forward to your questions at the end.
Great. Thanks, Mary, so much. So our next presenter is Holly Backus. So for the past four years, Holly has reviewed plans for compliance with the Nantucket Zoning Bylaw for the Planning Board. However, as of November 2019, she's been hired as the first preservation planner for the town of Nantucket. Congratulations, Holly. In addition, she is the town's local hazard mitigation plan coordinator and successfully managed the project to update the plan for FEMA approval in March 2019. She is highly involved with the town's resiliency and sustainability planning efforts. She has a bachelor's degree in historic preservation and uh, art and architectural history from Roger Williams University. After college, she became a land use planner for Berkeley County in South Carolina, which is a fast growing county outside of Charleston, South Carolina. She was there for approximately 10 years. Holly is a Nantucket na uh, native and is happy to be back home helping her island plan appropriately for the protection of the island's historic and cultural resources with the changing climate. Welcome, Holly. Holly, are you on mute? Hello? Can anybody hear me? Mary, we can hear you. Okay. You know, maybe why, why don't we go, if, if Holly's having some technical diff difficulties, why don't we go to th some questions? Okay, Mary, that sounds like a great idea. Um, I'll get in touch okay. with Holly. Um, actually, we had a couple of questions that came through while Mary was giving her presentation. So the first one um, uh, to, to Mary from FEMA, um, how soon and by how much is flood insurance in FEMA flood zones likely to rise? So that is unfortunately a question I cannot directly answer. Um, our national flood insurance program is currently up for renewal and there are going to be some changes associated with that, but that um, the NFIP program is not something the Environmental Historic Preservation Cadre works with directly. Um, if, if you can provide me with their contact information, I can pass that question on to our NFIP staff. They work just down the hall from me and I can have them reach out to you. If you don't mind collecting okay. that contact for me. Uh, no problem. I, I know who um, we, we know the person who submitted that. And um, as a follow up, the, another question: um, When is FEMA updating its flood zones to take climate change into consideration? Okay. Uh, this is also the NFIP is also, uh, like I said, not something I work with directly. Um, but the flood zone maps are regularly updated. There are yearly grant cycles associated with developing new flood maps, but of course, flood maps take several years. They are based on um, the a best science available model when it comes in. But um, like I said, I don't work with that program directly, so I can't really answer uh, questions about the NFIP um, with as much detail. Mary, if uh, if I can add one thing, this is Arnold. Um, sure. It's it's not a FEMA or government uh, resource that's out there, but another resource that I should mention because um, I've seen them at two conferences now presenting um, is the First Street uh, Foundation. Um, they're a, a data-driven nonprofit organization um, that is looking to make um, flood risk information more available to a broader audience, um, and so they have an interactive website. Um, that takes both past and forecast flood data um, and allows you to manipulate through um, a lot of its different layers in a very simple format to be able to basically look at any part of the United States um, and uh, understand what potential flood risks there are out there. Um, they're also looking at developing a property by property um, resource uh, for launch this spring. There's a beta version out now. Um, but they're looking to have something that's available. So basically they're sort of saying, 
you know, there are absolutely those FEMA maps that are available, um, but for a lot of folks, those can be difficult to read and difficult to understand designations. Um, and so they're looking to sort of take a lot of metadata, including uh, those FEMA maps, uh, but a lot of other resources uh, that might be available. And um, that's going to be an interesting trend to watch. Uh, someone uh, labeled it sort of akin to when Zillow began to post um, school ratings on each property. So you'd click on it and you'd not only see the property itself and how many bedrooms it had, but you'd see what the school district was like in terms of its um, quality. And I think as one person made a note of, you know, not a lot of people necessarily understand flood risk or, or sort of climate change impact risk. It's going to be interesting to see when more and more information sources become publicly accessible, how that will change people's perception of risk and how that might impact and how it will impact property values. Great. Arnold, we just got a request. Can you repeat the name of that group? Sure, that's the First Street Foundation, um, and I will actually add it to the PDF um, as a resource um, for national okay. information. Um, Wonderful. I, okay. Great. And um, I think we've resolved our, our connection issues. Um, I believe um, Holly is able to speak now, and we can hear her. Holly, can you hear us? Good morning. I can hear you all. Can you hear me? Okay. Wonderful. Mm. So I guess we'll pick right back up. I apologize. Um, if you wouldn't mind switching to the next slide. So, um, yes, I represent Nantucket. Nantucket was uh, created a, a local historic district back in 1955, one of the earliest. We were the second after uh, Charleston, South Carolina. We have one of the largest inventories of 18th and 19th century structures within um, 800 plus structures predating the pre-Civil War. So, of course, our historical and cultural resources is, is very important, as well as very important to note that a third of our uh, island is protected by open space. And we became a national historic landmark, so the entire island is a national historic landmark in 1966, and then we had a recent update in 2012. So the question is, what is being done to protect our historic buildings and landscapes? I could switch to the next slide. So Nantucket has definitely seen our share of nuisance flooding um, downtown, and uh, we have definitely uh, realized that this is a concern for us. These are some photos from the last couple of years from just regular flooding. Um, and we ha actually, the town has created a website kind of off of what Massachusetts has done with resilientact.org. You can go on to that site and see all our different planning initiatives for everything from our hazard mitigation to our MVP to our resiliency efforts. Next slide. So really, uh, I went to the first Keeping History Above Water Conference in Newport. It was fantastic. Um, I commend what Newport Restoration Foundation has been doing with that initiative and uh, had the pleasure of listening to Lisa Craig who was the Chief Historic Preservation Officer from the city of Annapolis, and she created this Weathering It Together program. And all I kept on hearing from her was to get your cultural resources within your hazard mitigation plan. So when um, I came back to the town, I had just recently been hired, maybe about six months in, I uh, had to present to the select board, um, and or the board of selectmen at the time, and they, wanted to hear what I learned. And that was the first thing I said to them. Where, where, does, where is our hazard mitigation plan stand? And at the time, we had our 2007 um, hazard mitigation plan, and it was needed to have an update. And it was kind of thrown in my lap, which was a, a blessing, because I was able to um, ask our consultants to get our historical cultural resources within the plan. Uh, next slide. And with that, we used part of, just a, a portion of FEMA's uh, guidelines that they created in 2005, where you integrate your historic property and cultural resources into the hazard mitigation plan. Uh, I will say we have a sliver um, annotated in our update, nothing like the Weathering It Together initiative from Annapolis, but I have mentioned um, that that's something that we would want to do um, because it, it just it just makes sense, especially for a national historic landmark. Next slide. So these 
this document right here, uh, basically are the strategies to make your historical cultural resources more resilient to the natural disaster. So it helps you identify your historical resources, revisit your historic district regulations, strengthen recovery planning, incorporate historic preservation into your planning documents, revisit your floodplain regulations and ordinances, coordinate regionally and, um, with the state, and your structural adaptation measures, and obviously education. Next slide. So with our hazard mitigation plan update, uh, we were able to come up with a tagline um, to mitigate the detrimental impacts of natural hazards to Nantucket while maintaining and enhancing the island's quality of life, historic essence, aesthetic beauty, and natural and habitat resources. We were very successful and finally received our uh, approval from FEMA and adoption from the select board back in, in March of, of this year. And happy to say that we, with the help of our consultant, were able to get the historical cultural resources component into our plan. At least they were finally identified, which is what I learned from Lisa Craig. Next slide, please. That's our statement. All right, next slide. So, out of our uh, updated plan, we actually had two priorities that were identified. One was to conduct a targeted hazard vulnerability assessment with our, of our historic structures and offer technical assistance to property owners. And the next strategy was to adopt a set of design guidelines that encourage flood proofing elevation of structures while maintaining their historic character. Obviously, this is something that has been um, detrimental um, and, and something that uh, historic communities has been grasping. How do we maintain our historical identity while we're trying to adapt? Um, and we had 10 areas within our hazard plan that were identified as vulnerable, including our historic downtown area. Next slide. Oh, yeah, this is our, our list. This is at, out of the hazard plan, we had five, uh, 55 approximate priorities. So in January 2018, we became a we actually did the workshop for the MVP program, and we became an MVP community. And of course, this is what our, um, Arnold had mentioned previously, but the resiliency planning really encompasses multiple areas in, in their focus. And being a island, being a historic island, preservation is, is part of our community. Um, it's in, in, a big part of our community. So it was second nature for us to say, hey, who are these stakeholders that need to be involved in this, uh, this important discussion? And our preservation and our um, conservation folks were included. It was about an eight long, um, eight hour uh, long process during the day and really had a, a great amount of, of people to, to collaborate. And these were our, our uh, top five actions to improve resilience for Nantucket. Uh, we created a, um, requirement for a resiliency coordinator and through that we have a resiliency coordinator for the town and he is in charge of working with a coastal resiliency advisory committee that has been um, requested on behalf of the select board so they um, they celebrate to the select board on their recommendations um, they are going to be working on creating a coastal resiliency plan in the near future the second one was about our isolation from the mainland we're an island. When we have uh, a wind event, a rain event, that can uh, hinder our transportation to and from the island. What are we doing um, looking at that resiliency component? As well as our wetland restoration. What can we do to help with the flood inundation that's happening downtown within our historic areas and also other areas? Um, maybe looking at things like green infrastructure. Is that something that we can um, incorporate? And then, of course, our historic preservation guidelines, and which I'll talk about here in a minute. And then our road system resiliency. Um, what are we doing to accommodate with um, our transportation system? Next slide. Oops, sorry. Okay. So out of our uh, MVP, um, we were able to apply for an, an action grant. And of course, as soon, I don't even think the certificate from NVP, from the, from, um, the Commonwealth was 
was dry um, and it was like, okay, let's, we got to apply for a grant. What are we going to apply for? And I was very fortunate enough to be a part of that conversation with town administration. And I said, hey, why don't we work on our preservation guidelines? So we were able to um, create a, or apply for um, this MVP action grant to preserve our historic streetscapes while mitigating for hazards. And in September, um, I was hoping by this point we would have a consultant, but um, we're still, we still have our RFP out and we're hoping to get a consultant soon so we can uh, work on our resilient Nantucket design for adaptation. And I know the Commonwealth is, is very excited uh, for, for where this goes uh, as, just as much as, as I am. Next slide. And then earlier this year, in June, uh, Nantucket was able to be uh, a part of the Keeping History Above Water uh, program. It was a joint collaboration between the University of Florida Preservation Institute Nantucket, which on a sidebar, I'm very happy to say I'm actually a, a Penn graduate myself. Uh, the Nantucket Preservation Trust, which is where I started my love for preservation at the age of 16, and the town of Nantucket. Uh, we actually uh, received funding from um, our CPC, as well as CZM, uh, the Osceola Foundation, and Remain Nantucket, and the Preservation Institute, Nantucket, PIN students, they worked on this 3D digital, digital documentation, um, and the results are just, are mind blown, really and truly. Um, they digitally, digitally documented our historic downtown waterfront and created these 3D visualizations, which are available actually on their website, which I have on the, on the screen. Um, it, it just unbelievable. And hopefully we'll be able to utilize the documentation that they have um, come up with. Next slide. So our MVP action grant that we have been awarded um, we have titled our project Resilient Nantucket Design for Adaptation. Obviously, it's to build upon our MVP uh, Resiliency Workshop Report, our hazard mitigation, and the program that we did with Resilient Nantucket with the, um, the PIN program. And uh, really, um, I wanted to want to mention something. When it comes to the hazard mitigation plan, that has been the foundation for um, being able to say, okay, if you have some of these actions that are required by FEMA to help you adapt, but you also are able to um, indicate them within your MVP, and again, um, I think Arnold was hitting the nail on the head, and Massachusetts is definitely um, in the forefront when it comes to allowing their communities this, this opportunity. Um, we were able to utilize this action grant not only to help uh, create our historic gu guidelines that were outlined within our report for our MVP, but also those two um, priorities that were established within our hazard mitigation plan. So almost a double dip, but a great reason to double dip. And it actually helps that out when you're applying for those particular grants if it's outlined in more places than one. So our project is gonna consist of three phases with uh, public input and public workshops. We're wanting to provide a public awareness toolkit for people, as well as have people from NEMA, FEMA, CZM, our town, local boards, uh, and community groups be involved. Um, these guidelines are going to um, help indicate our, our flood adaptation and building elevation design details. So the town of Nantucket, through its historic district commission, we have a pretty good, uh, what we call, building with Nantucket in mind to help protect our historic character. And over the years, it has been augmented, um, added to with addendums, what have you. And this is gonna be a very important one moving forward to it. Next slide. So again, we're calling this Resilient Nantucket. And our next um, thing, we'll be able to have these meetings to bridge preservation with our coastal resiliency efforts through our Historic District Commission, our reenacted Historical Commission, as well as the newly created Coastal Resiliency Advisory Committee. And these are just some um, workshops from the past when we were going through our resiliency efforts. Um, I just wanted to, to add, again, um, it was a, 
kind of a, a quick um, process as far as going all at once. Uh, we are in the middle of our hazard mitigation plan, which m most folks probably know that it, it can take a couple of years when you go through that for that update. Uh, while we were doing that, we we applied to, to do the MVP program. And, and then we also started getting some information about how we can create our own town-wide coastal resiliency plan, which we did receive some um, key information that will be helpful for our coastal resiliency advisory committee to use while they move forward creating their RFP um, for their uh, coastal resiliency plan. And of course, the biggest thing is how does this all link together and making sure that preservation and the uh, identification of our historical cultural resources, which obviously have been as a national historic landmark, are included in that conversation. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks, Holly. That, that was great. Um, so Aaron, I'll turn it over to you um, so we can start to go through some of the, the questions that people have um, yep. submitted. Yep. Um, uh, since um, well, um, we had a couple questions just pop through when uh, when Holly was uh, when Holly was on talking. Um, someone asked if it was possible to have the website for the three D images posted again. Um, oh, oh, on the wrong way. I believe it was. Um, I don't know if it was if it was this one. Um, I think it is that one with the hyperlink okay. at the bottom. Yes, and and ju and ju just to note that um, this actual uh, the PowerPoint that um, that all of our attendees are seeing the PowerPoint itself is available on Preservation Massachusetts website as part of our archive for the statewide conference. Um, I can put a link through to that as well when I send um, emails out with um, the recording of this webinar on there. So there was that, and um, um, a question, um, Holly. I think this was um, perhaps directed at you, but anyone feel free to. To chime in, um, how does the homeowner toolkit combine adaptation in general with or ad adaptation in general with adaption for historic homes? Um. So that's what's going to be with our consultant, whoever that may be. Um, oh. Once we hire them, they're they're the ones that are going to help us create this toolkit. But really, it's going to be um, something that they they know what's available to them from FEMA. Um, as an individual property owner, but also that w that's going to segue into when we create these guidelines locally, what are we going to allow? Because that's the big biggest conversation. You know, FEMA wants you to build X amount, um, but we have a influx of um, obviously historical resources, historic structures, but we also have infill that are coming in. Um, under Massachusetts uh, 4181L, under the subdivision control law, we're seeing uh, properties, historic properties that are being subdivided under that law exemption and that's allowing people to build new, um, whether they're recycling the home for another location on the island or they're able to get a demolition permit if it's a sub substructure and, and having to um, adapt to some of the standards. So where does, where does that fall into? And that's the biggest part of our conversation and why our Historic District Commission is really looking forward to going through this process and creating these guidelines. So we, we hope to make it so all property owners um, that have a historic structure within the FEMA flood zone in our historic district are, are able, or know what's available to them and what they can do to uh, adapt. Okay. Do you have any workshops scheduled for 2020 at this point? That was another question. For Nantucket, I, I, I believe I think that I think that was directed to, to you. <laughs> Any workshops on Nantucket <laughs> for 2020? <laughs> um, as far as I can talk about, um, I, I do. You know, once we do uh, hire a consultant and go through this this process that was um, established in our MVP grant, we will have those individual workshops at that point. Um, that is mm -hmm. something that we've asked for. Um, but I do know that preservation, our Nantucket Preservation Trust is working on a uh, symposium um, that they're looking at the town of Nantucket to be a partner with and probably even pin. 
Um, and I would assume that uh, resiliency will be a, a topic within that, but I don't know the specifics, and I think that's still in, in the designing stages. Okay, thank you. Um, a couple more uh, questions that came through um, earlier back when um, when uh, Mary uh, was talking, uh, when Mary from FEMA was talking. Um, Mary, does FEMA ever make private sector grants? FEMA grants are available to um, states, uh, local governments, tribal governments, um, individual property owners through the individual assistance program, as well as as subrecipients from state grants, and but not generally to private institutions um, that are not private not for profits. Um, so, no, I think is the okay. general answer to that. Okay. Okay. Um, are, Mary, um, are there good examples of FEMA providing money to state and tribal historic preservation officers to enhance their maps of cultural resources to better inform responses to disasters and also inform pre-mitigation planning? Uh, there is one I know of off the top of my head, um, and that is um, as a result of Katrina. Um, the wide-scale uh, work that was done at and Katrina, both demolitions um, and acquisitions of properties that had been substantially flooded um, when the levees breached as part of the mitigation uh, under a memorandum of agreement that was developed, we funded the development of the state of Louisiana's online archaeological uh, database. Um, so that database was developed with FEMA money um, associated with an adverse effect. Um, as far as grants um, under PDM, I don't know of one off the top of my head, but um, as a general rule, it is there's a, there are ways to get at it. But yeah, it is it, the the case I know of was an adverse effect. And Aaron, one thing one thing I'd just add for that is that one of the things that comes up in many communities is that documentation of the most endangered resources within a community due to any climate change impact is sort of job one. I mean, you can't if you if you think things are going to be lost, um, and you do, and your documentation dates from the 1970s and 80s. Um, there's a lot of new technology. There's a lot of new approaches to doing documentation um, that exist. Uh, that if you lose those resources, you want to be able to have that record. Um, and so we've seen a bunch of communities we work with go for CLG grants and be successful or even go to private foundations um, and have that documentation funded. So um, I think it's sort of one of the base things any community can do is if you overlay that mapping of what's most endangered and what's most historic um, is to do that documentation even if you can't get to adaptation for a little while. That's a great suggestion. Thank you, Arnold. Um, I think this one, um, another question, kind of open it up to everybody. Um, what type of effects and mitigation for heat issues? I can add from a from an MVP standpoint, um, the MVP program focuses on nature-based solutions. So while when a lot of communities do their planning, they talk about creating cooling centers within like an emergency management facility um, or other things, one of the things that we recommend a lot of communities do is to increase tree cover. And certainly historically, a lot of communities had robust street tree populations. Um, they can be a danger uh, in certain storm events, but um, one of the things that can really help both suck up stormwater, but also uh, mitigate heat island effect, especially in built up town centers or city centers, um, is to have a robust tree pop and healthy tree population. Um, so one of the primary uh, MVP responses um, is that nature-based solution of really working on a robust natural tree cover. Great, thank you, Arnold. Um, another FEMA-directed question. Um, where a town in Massachusetts has done its multi-hazard mitigation plan and identified a specific project, what's the cycle for grant application? And is there a link to the application or a place they can go to get that? Um, so it depends on the type of grant. Um, the pre-disaster mitigation grants, flood assistance grants, those are on an annual cycle. So um, at the moment, we're waiting for our appropriations to come through for this year, but once they do, there will be um, an application period will open. I um, I can attach it to, I think I can send it over and attach the link 
to the PDF we provided earlier. We're wanting to work with MEMA, the Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency, to help you apply for those grants. And the contact over there, her name is Sarah White. Um, and they can help work you through that, but I will provide a link to add to the PDF. Thank you very much, Mary. Does anybody else have any other um, any other questions? Um, um, so far, um, that was um, all of the questions that had been um, had come through the chat box. Um, but I also wanted to point out that there were um, people were sharing some um, some links and good examples. Um, that corresponded with uh, the conversation and the presentations. Um, thank you for um, for sharing those. And what we'll do is um, take those links and um, include them um, on the page where we're going to have the uh, the webinar posted. So we'll have those examples that people were sharing throughout the webinar. So thank you very very much. Um, I'll give it like another few seconds if anyone has any additional questions for our presenters. And also, if you have questions and you didn't have an opportunity to, um, or you know, you have a question in the next few minutes, um, you can always feel free to email email me at Preservation Mass, um, and I will um, do my best to find out the answer to your question or connect you with uh, one of our presenters who knows so much better than I. So, Erin, this is Mary uh, Thompson. So, one of the things we talked about um, when we were in Plymouth was of the next step is a call to action. Um, and I don't know, Arnold, if you have any thoughts on, on that um, for yeah. this group? I, I think the, you know, using Preservation Massachusetts as the clearinghouse to this particular audience, I think um, we'll continue to see sort of the evolution of, of this as an information source, um, both static, where folks can go and find resources on the website. Um, but I think the other interesting thing is that uh, is, is sort of pushing the information out. There are people who couldn't attend this webinar today who we want to be able to make sure they catch the updated information as things move forward. Um, uh, Maine is making some huge moves forward in its climate resiliency, and, and they've been very thoughtful about integrating preservation. So I think really I would urge everybody who was on this call to think about yourself as part of an ongoing community that's having this discussion, and really you know stay tuned to Preservation Massachusetts because you can use all these technical ways. We don't need to gather in the same room per se. We can keep sharing information dynamically. Um, so that that'd be my hope, and I'm uh, as a volunteer uh, really looking forward to staying engaged in that. Yeah, I, I agree, and I, I will echo that. Well, I think um, one of the great things, um, I mean, after um, after the statewide preservation conference in September, we got um, uh, Mary, um, myself, and Jim Igo from Preservation Massachusetts got an email from Arnold saying, okay, what are we going to do next? What's the next step? And really, this webinar was that, um, just to try to get as much information, get this important information out um, to as many people as possible. And as you see on your screen, and as we've said, um, this webinar will be uploaded to Preservation Massachusetts website. Um, and the links that we've been collecting um, throughout this um, throughout this presentation, um, and also any updated information, as Arnold said, the handout that we sent out to you earlier today um, is really a living document. So when we get new links, new information, um, we really hope to be uploading as much as possible. So if you're looking for information on climate change, preservation, resiliency, um, we encourage you to come to Preservation Massachusetts website. Um, everybody who even signed up for this uh, webinar, I know there were some people that couldn't attend, uh, will get an, um, an email from us that has a link to the exact page where you can find all this information. Um, and continue to share. If you find a great resource, um, a great new um, set of guidelines that is helpful, good examples, models, um, feel free to share with them. I think um, uh, we're all in this together. And you know, as Arnold said, we're part of this community that's really trying to push this conversation forward. So. Um, with that, um, I just want to give a huge, huge thanks uh, to Mary, Arnold, Holly, and Mary. Um, thank you so much for giving of your time and expertise yet again. Um, thank you all for joining us today and um, working with us through some technical issues. Um, we're excited for this to be our first webinar, and we look forward to using this platform as another way to um, for other preservation topics. So um, we hope you have a wonderful day, and thank you all for what you do for our preservation um, in your community. And with that,
have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye.